is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zanker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker, and I'm your host. And on this show, we are hosting the greatest leaders, entrepreneurs, and gurus that are going to help you to help you take back time. And what that is for me is to help you to think and act more strategically. So today, I'm super excited to have a good friend of mine here, Steve Farber. He is listed on Inc.'s top 50 leadership and management experts in the world and number one on Huffington Post's 12 business speakers to see. Steve Farber is a best-selling author, a popular keynote, a seasoned leadership coach, consultant, and he's worked with a vast array of public and private organizations in every virtual arena. And might I add, he's a darn good singer and guitar player with that. He's a former vice president of legendary management guru, Tom Peters Company, and is founder of the CEO of Extreme Leadership Institute, organization devoted in helping its clients develop award-winning cultures and achieve radical results. The Institute's team has helped over 25 companies earn a ranking on the best places to work list. And I can go on and on and on, but I really want you to hear directly from Steve himself. So without further ado, Steve Farber! Was that a drum roll? That was very good. Personally, I'd rather hear you go on and on and on. Oh, really? Yeah, no, no, just kidding. I see you Uh, blushing over there. Yeah, I I am. I am. That's, That's my good lighting in my office. Thank you, Penny. It's great to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. Because, you know, I saw you speak, I guess it was a couple months ago now, or, or maybe, yeah, maybe half a year. And, uh, you know, I, I really loved the message that you had to share. And also, you know, I added in there, you were a great guitar player and singer, because that really surprised me, you know, the, how much of yourself you brought to your speaking. So tell us sort of the foundation of why is your book called, you know, what it is that, that love is just damn good business. Like, why are you in love with love? <clears throat> yeah. So it's a great question. There's a very specific reason why I chose to title the book, Love is Just Damn Good Business. It's because love is just damn good business. <laughs> it just is. <clears throat> yeah. So listen, I've been doing this kind of work now for a long time. And by this kind of work, I mean, you know, consulting and leadership development and all that sort of a thing in, in the business world for, it's been 30 years now. And so I, you know, I've noticed a few things along the way. I don't claim to have it all figured out, certainly, but striking observation that I can offer to people in any business is that as uncomfortable as we are in using the word love and business in the same sentence, it is really the foundation of what great business is. And it's really the foundation of what great leadership is. So it's, it's kind of odd or ironic or tragic or something that we seem to resist the very idea that makes us the most successful. That's interesting. You know, I was thinking before our, our interview, you know, there's an expression, it's just business, it's not personal. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, it's, uh, everything's personal. Of course it is, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, so, listen, I understand the rationale behind it. If I have to fire you, for example, I'm not making a personal judgment necessarily on who you are as a human being and your value as a person. You may not be a good fit for the business. It could be that I have to cut back. So in that sense, it's not a personal affront to you, but everything is personal. We take everything personally because it's us. It's our lives that we're, that we're living. And what we do at work and what happens at work and in our careers is a, is a big part of our lives. So it's all personal. And if we choose to acknowledge that, then it leads us to an interesting place. What is it about the experience of working and the experience of doing business with a company, let's say, as a consumer, that on a personal level affects us the most in the most positive way? And to me, that is simply, it it comes down to love, right? 
if I love doing business with you, if I'm the, the customer, I love doing business with you, I love your product, your service, the combination of the two, I love the way you respond to my needs, I love the way you fix things when they go wrong, I love the way you offer me solutions that I didn't even know, the problems I didn't even know I had until right. I see your solution, that's where my loyalty is going to come from, right? Absolutely. So that's personal. It's a personal thing. And then internally, if I love working here, if I love the people I'm working with, and I believe in what we're doing, I'm going to bring myself more fully to my work. That's personal. So it's not that we have to get beyond this idea that somehow there is, we categorize and compartmentalize our lives into there's work and there's other. We play different roles at work and at home. We do different things most of the time, uh, but we're the same person. I mean, literally, we're the same person. Right. And why same can't DNA, we same DNA, same internal ourselves. organs, right. same virus. <laughs> same virus. <laughs> Don't Sorry, say just, the virus just trying to be just trying to be topical. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're the, we're the same person. So why not why not just acknowledge that and take advantage in a positive way of this wonderful component that we have as, as human beings that, you know, connection and experience are really important to us. And why not be able to love the time that we spend in business? Absolutely. And bring more joy, right? And make everything better. As a matter of fact, you know, I was thinking, you know, some people might be thinking, well, you know, what does love have to do with productivity, love in your business? What does that have to do with productivity and taking back time? How can you put it really specific for people so they're clear why this is so important to the productivity of their business? Yeah, I think it's I think it's an it's an interesting question because the question itself belies the underlying assumption that we make, which is that love is somehow other than productive. So to answer your question directly, if I love the work that I'm doing, the people that I'm doing it for, the people on my team, I'm going to be more productive because I feel a greater sense of responsibility to them, a higher level of commitment, a greater level of accountability for getting things done. If I don't care about this place, this is the, the polar opposite, right? Yeah. If I'm disengaged, I don't care, I'm apathetic, whatever, then productivity is simply, it's, it's only going to happen as a result of, of somebody you know, pressing their thumb, their thumb into my back and saying, either produce or you're out of here. And right. And that's not really effective, is it? I mean, you might get a short-term result, but at the end, you're not really getting engagement in the long run. And, and people end up leaving if that's the way that's, right. that's the way that it's run. So, so you may get a result, right. singular, but if you want results over time, plural, then that comes from people being really committed and, and commitment and love are very closely related to each other. Absolutely. You know what I was thinking of as you were saying that is when we're in love, time goes away, right? It's like we're in the flow. And so when we can work and time can go away in the context of we just, we could spend 8, 12, 14 hours doing whatever it is that we're doing and loving it, enjoying it and bringing value to it. That is, that's the ultimate, right? That's what we're looking for. So of course, if love is putting us in that place and is part of flow, yeah, then it's productive. Completely. Yeah, I remember, um, I just flashed back on this. Maybe I'm the only one that ever had this experience in school. But I remember sitting in class, in some god-awful high school class, and watching the clock, waiting for that, that bell to ring. And man, I understood even back then when Einstein meant by time is relative. Because <laughs> it was really freaking slow, right? Yeah. And on the other hand, if you love what you're doing, it just, like you said, it, fly, it flies by. Why? So it's interesting that we, you know, I never really thought about love before as a way to take back time or, or to change the nature of it. But that, that is really, in essence, what it does for us subjectively. I agree. I agree. And so that I just wanted to make sure people were like, what? You bring somebody on to talk about love. What does that have to do with productivity? I just want to make sure that they understand my, my way of thinking here. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it, and it's, it's a great point. So the framework that I offer in, in the book, Love is Just Damn Good Business, and I've been, I've been teaching this for many, many years now, is do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. That's the um, uh, kind of the, uh, the, the credo behind this whole thing. So if you break that down into its elements, doing what you love, that's the foundation for it, right? So it's your heart connected to your work. 
that's not where it stops because in business and in society and in families and in communities, it's not enough for us to just be doing what we love. We, we've got to be giving value to other people, right? So yeah. do what you love in the service of people, right? And we're, so that's the business context for it, as well as the, the moral and ethical context. If all I'm doing is what I love and I don't really care about the impact of that on anybody else, as long as I'm getting what I want, that's just another way of saying narcissism, right? right. So I'm doing what I love in the service of people and I'm serving them in such a significant way that they reciprocate. In other words, they love me in return, right? So do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. And what so if it's they that don't? In the Let's service. Talk about that for a minute. What if they don't? Well, we need to do a better job for one thing. And also, if my customers, if I'm doing what I love and I feel like I'm serving you, and the, the feedback that I get from you as a customer, for example, is that you don't love what I do. You, I do like a net promoter score with you or you know, some, other, uh-huh. some other measurement of that. Then I have something to learn there, don't I? So I might think that I'm serving you in a way that you're going to love, but you're obviously not. And you're obviously not responding that way. So I, I need to learn from that and, and change it. Because ultimately, as we want our customers to love what we're doing for them. That's where our competitive advantage comes from. Yeah. And if we really love, like you're saying, I think then we want to learn because we, like you said, in service, right? So then you're taking that love and saying, okay, you know, it's nurturing. It's okay. Well, if, if this isn't what you want, then let me, you know, let me change. Let me adapt. Let me bring it in a different exactly. way. And I feel that that's part of love, right? Is being flexible sure it is. and meeting somebody where they're at adding that additional value. So, and it comes back to your question about productivity. So if I'm, if I'm really serving you, one of the ways that I can measure that is how productive am I being? So productivity, innovation, creativity, I mean, these are all different facets of the same gemstone, right? Yeah. If, I'm being, if I'm innovative and creative, kind of doesn't matter if I can't execute on it and get it done. So if I really want to serve you, I've got to be firing on, I know I'm mixing up metaphors here a little bit. <laughs> Firing on all cylinders, hitting all facets of the gemstone, firing on all gemstones. Pick your metaphor. That's really what it comes down to. This is applicable in every aspect of our lives. And I intend this discussion and the book, of course, to be geared to business people. This is a business practice. Operationalizing love in the way that we do business is where our competitive advantage would come from. If it's just a nice to have or it's, or it's uh, you know, it's, it's just kind of, you know, soft California touchy feely hoo ha crap, then what's the point? Right. So, like I said, I've been around for a while. I'm not making this up. I didn't come on, you know, come on to this in a, in a vacuum. It's really based on a lot of observation of a lot of companies, a lot of individuals who get phenomenal things done in profitable ways because they have found a way to answer the question, what does love look like in the way that I do business? And if I could show that to my customers, the chances are pretty damn good that they're going to stick around for a while. Absolutely. So let's answer that question. So give us an idea, an example. How do you operationalize love? For yeah. business? So it starts with, well, first of all, let, let's just talk about the nature of the word for a moment because you know, language is important. It's also a little bit limiting and I, I don't want to get caught up in semantics. So let's just, first of all, understand that we use the word love in a lot of contexts and to describe a lot of different things. And, and we use the word interchangeably, even when the actual experience is not interchangeable. So for example, I love pizza. Right. And I love my wife. I love them very differently. <laughs> right? Hopefully. One, one, exactly. One I shouldn't love and one I should. Right. So, but, but I still use the same word. So there's something, it's describing something familiar in me. So the the key to this is that people will self-describe the experience as something that I love. Mm -hmm. So if our clients say, I love doing business with you, it's true for them. Mm -hmm. And they may have a very different interpretation of what that means or how they would define it, but they still describe it the same way. Right. It's an emotional connection, right? It's an emotional connection. definitely say that, is it's emotional connection. Yeah, it's it's a positive emotional connection. Yeah, positive. So the question then is, what should that look like? We can answer that thousands of different ways. So so I'll give you a couple of examples. And um, 
This is probably an example that I shared when you heard me speak not too long ago, because it's my favorite case study of the moment. So there's a company called Trailer Bridge in Jacksonville, Florida. And I love this example because they don't stereotypically fit the mold of a company that would be operationalizing love because they are not a particularly um, you know, glamorous business. They're, they're, in the, they're a shipping company. Okay. They ship goods from primarily Jacksonville to Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. You know, they ship barges of goods. That's what they do. Woohoo! <laughs> they, um, but you don't think that people like that stand around and uh, hold hands and sing kumbaya? Is that what you're saying? Well, they get pretty damn close, as it turns <laughs> out, but only as a, a kind of an analogy. So let me explain why they're such a great example of exactly what we're talking about here. So the, the backstory on Trailer Bridge is that they've been around for 30 years and their history is not the most, it's not the healthiest, let me say. They were, in fact, a toxic place for many years terrible customer scores. They were the low price option Mm -hmm. because the people weren't coming to them because of their service. They were coming to them because they were cheap and they were cheap because people didn't like their service. (laughs) Right. Right. It's one of that vicious kind of a cycle. Right. They had lots of turnover. People couldn't stand working there. And ultimately they went bankrupt. And when they came out of bankruptcy, they burned through four CEOs in two years. So the, the place was really, it just was not a healthy place to work. Mitch Luciano took over. He was tapped by the board to turn the company around. He agreed to do it because he really believed in the company. He believed in a lot of the people there, not all of them, but he believed in a lot of them. He loved the place and what they were capable of doing. But he said, he told the board, he said, I'll do it, but I don't want the title of CEO because people are burned out on CEOs. I have to earn that title. Right. So I'll be president. I'll earn the title of CEO. When these folks are ready to call me the CEO, that's when I'll take the, the label, right? So symbolic right from the start. Distractions are the enemy of productivity. Go to distractionquiz.com and find out your distraction profile. Are you a time zombie or a hamster? Take this free distraction quiz today to rate your ability to focus on what keeps you from being a wizard. Go to distractionquiz.com. Mitch's whole, whole idea was this. In order to turn this place around, we first of all, we have to create a culture and environment that people love working in. Because if we want our customers to love us and therefore do business with us, be willing to spend more money with us, talk about us to other people, they have to love it, right? So we have to make this a place that people will love working in. And so he, he went about answering the question, what would that look like? Did he already have connection with you? And is this something he came up with on its own? Or had you worked with him before? And this is like, he'd grown into this or discovered this? Funny you should ask. Yeah. So Mitch was a, a fan of my books. So he had read The Radical Leap was my first book. The Radical Edge was book number two. Greater Than Yourself was my third book. Uh, Love is Just Damn Good Business is number four. Got it. Uh, So he had read The Radical Leap, Radical Edge, Greater Than Yourself. The common theme throughout all of these and through everything that I do is that our role as leaders and business people is to to cultivate love, Mm -hmm. to create an environment that people love working in, that love is really a powerful business principle. I've been saying that for years. Radical Leap first came out in 2004, just to give you an idea of the time frame. Right. So I had not yet met Mitch, but he was a practitioner of my work. Awesome. So I learned about this after the fact. Mm -hmm. So he went to his board who were, you know, investment bankers and, you know, bottom line kind of guys, you know, private equity folks, you know, that that usual thing. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll take the job. He said, but, you know, I won't take the title of CEO. And you guys have to let me do what I want to do because this is going to be different from what you expect because I'm a love guy. Did he say that? He said that directly, I'm a love guy. I don't think he said those words. (laughs) But that's what he was thinking. That's what he was thinking. So he said, okay, I got to make this a place that people love working in. So what should that look like? So here's what he did. He did any number of things. And by the way, he gets very squirmy when I describe it as this is what he did. Because it's all about what we did, if you ask him. Right. right? Well, he sounds like a very humble, 
very humble guy. Great leader, yeah. Humble guy, great leader, and a, and a hardcore business guy. I mean, he's a bottom line driven guy, mm-hmm. right? But he understands that that's not where you, where you start. So he said, okay, I want to create an environment that people love working in. So what does that mean? It means they have to, the people that work here have to know each other. Really basic. Yeah. If I love my team, that means I know the people who are on my team. I, I have a connection with them. I know about their families. I know about their aspirations. I know about their challenges. So he said, how do I, it's not happening here, <laughs> right? So he got very granular about what he should do. So here's what he did. Number one, this was a company at the time of, I think it was 160 people. Mm-hmm. And traditionally, they all wore name tags. Hello, my name is. He said, what the hell are we wearing name tags for? We're 160 people. Right. We should know each other's names. So let's start with that. So the first thing he did was actually a little bit symbolic and practical. He got rid of the name tags. Now, think about what that meant for him as the leader of the company. He had to learn everybody's name. Right. right? So it started to change his connection with people because now he knew their names and that kind of blew them away. And he's saying, hey, you need to know each other's names too. And we need to get to know each other. So they lived in Cubicle City, floor to ceiling partitions everywhere. Uh, So people that had worked together for years very rarely saw each other, even when they're sitting right next to each other. So he lowered the heights of the cubicles so people could actually look at each other. He encouraged his management team to get out of their offices where people were holed up all day long and get out and mingle with folks and get to know each other. He looked at other aspects of the physical environment. He created a, like a break room, kind of a communal area, ping pong tables, foosball tables. You know, he kind of borrowed that idea right. from Silicon Valley and all right. that. And then every Thursday, I think it's Thursday, and they still do this to this day, they bring in a food truck. They park it outside the office building. They invite everybody. They buy lunch for everybody so they can all eat together once a week. All of this to get people to know each other. And as they got to know each other, lo and behold, they got to like each other. And as they got to like each other, they realized how much they love working there. And the dynamic of the environment started to change, right? All by answering the question, what should love look like in this building, right? Then at the same time, they were looking at their approach to their customers. And he encouraged his team to show, to prove to their customers that they'll do anything to make them happy that, because they love them. And there's thousands of examples. It's a bit of an exaggeration, yeah. but yeah. lots of examples. But one thing they did that really struck me is they got, like I said, granular. They went right into their policies and procedures. And they looked at some of their long-standing protocols. One of them being that they would not ship a barge out of the dock until it was at least 75% full. Because if they shipped at less than 75%, they would lose money on the ship. Right. So if you look at it from a balance sheet perspective, it makes perfect sense, right? right. Can't do that because we're not in the business to lose money. So they just turned that on its ear and they said, now, wait a minute. If we look at it from the customer's perspective, so you're the customer, you're shipping a car to Puerto Rico for your family. You tell them it's going to be there on such and such a date. It doesn't sail. It, they, they, never, it didn't, they don't get it. The reason it never got there is because the company tells you they didn't sell enough space, so it's still sitting in the dock. Right. Well, I don't care. Exactly. So they asked the question, well, if we really loved our customers, what would we do then? And then the answer is pretty obvious. You, you would ship. Right. Even if you lose money on that shipment, you would still ship because that, that's what you said you would do. Right. And so that's what they started on. doing. So that, and it goes on and on and on and on. So just fast forward to the punchline. They're always at least 98 to 100% full now when they, when they ship. Right. And if you trace that down, why is that? Because their customer service is so great now. They have fantastic customers. They, their turnover has, has dropped significantly. Uh, their best recruiters are their own employees now. They have, uh, they've ranked number one and number two best place to work in the city of Jacksonville two years in a row. Last two years of the company, the revenues the last two years of the company have exceeded the previous 25 years of the company combined. So all by answering the question, what should this look like? So it's not enough to say, oh, let's just love everybody and yeah. we love our customers and print the banners and the buttons. It's if that's true, what would we do differently around here? So right. I love it that comes example. Down to because behavior, right? It comes down, I mean, you know, with any observable, value. Wanna... Observable behavior. Exactly. And that on every level, and, on and a and systemic and level, on a policy level, on an inter, you know, interpersonal level, in physical environment, everything. So, and that just shows how 
operationalizing love is actually very productive because it's going to increase engagement. It's right. I'm sure people were not sick as often, right? And those are things that cost the organization less mistakes, more customers, yeah. right? So it's yes, exactly. Day, it's it's uh, it's core to productivity. So the takeaway from that is whatever kind of business you're in, for those listening to our conversation, just start with that question. If we really loved our customers, what would we do differently? And it's a, it's a powerful question. So the, the traditional question is to you know, pull your team together and say, what can we do to improve our customer service, for example? Right. Which is a great question. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to yield some good ideas. But if you ask the question in the other way, how can we show our customers that we love them? It raises the bar and it raises the standards and the quality of the answer is going to be different because now we have something really to reach for. So this well, idea that somehow love much- is soft and squishy and it's counterproductive <laughs> is insane. That's insane. Well, I just to add my thing there back to what we talked about earlier is it makes it more emotional, both for the people delivering it and the people receiving it. So not only is it up the bar, but it because it's more specific and it touches an emotional aspect, the answers are going to be different. Yes. Versus, versus <clears throat> clinically, what can we do, right? To, to right. Make- and, okay. and by the way, not emotional at the expense of the clinical and the rational. Right. It's both and, right? It's, I understand why this idea is going to yield greater profitability, let's say. Right. But I also care in the way that we do it. I also, I also love the idea. So we're not sacrificing you know, emotion for, for reason, or, and we shouldn't be doing it. it. Vice versa is what we've done, I think, right. in business. We've sacrificed, yeah, whatever the opposite of that was. Right. We, we will pursue reason at the expense of an emotional connection. We want to do both. Right. We want to do both. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I think that's so critical in leaving people with something very simple, which is one question that they can ask is, is extremely powerful, right? Break that down into take your executive team, take all the teams in your organization and have them answer that question. And, you know, it would be really exciting to see what they come up with. Yeah. And, you know, we have a great time at the Extreme Leadership Institute helping companies to do that very thing. We have some clients that we've worked with for multiple years, because if you think about what is required, it starts with that simple question, but then it's, well, what are the implications of that on everything that we do Right. for you know, it's even the, the, peop- the kinds of people that we hire and the way that we hire them, how we do performance appraisals, how we reward people, what our physical environment looks like, our, our HR policies, you know, all of that can be impacted by that very powerful question. And when that starts to happen, the results are really quite extraordinary. That's awesome. And like anything, when you want to get there and you want to get there faster, you work with people who have already done it and are experts in it. So how do we find out people who are listening more information about you, about the Leadership Institute or, or any of the other amazing programs that you have? Yeah, thank you. So there's uh, two major websites. SteveFarber.com is where I live. And then you know, I'm also the founder and president of the Extreme Leader- Leadership Institute. Actually, that's not true. I'm the founder and CEO. Jenna Lynch is the president, who's quite brilliant. She's brought 28 companies onto the best place to work list in her career. So that's extremeleadership.com. You can learn about, about what we do there. And um, we just started our own podcast, Love is Just Damn Good Business Podcast. So we're pretty excited about that. And on social media, I'm all over the place. If you can remember my name, you can find me on you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the usual haunts. We're everywhere. Awesome. Well, thank you. You know, let me ask you one personal question, right? Yeah. Outside of the, uh, the love driving the core of productivity. But, you know, as a, as a leader yourself and managing the multiple businesses that you manage and whatnot, what are some of the key strategies and tools that you use in order to be most productive? So I think I'm more productive than I give myself credit for. You know, I'm not, uh, if, you, if you were to ask me to list my characteristics and qualities, as a business guy, would not be at the top of the list. But I will tell you, you... some things that work for you, right? That's all. We're yes. just sharing, yeah. sharing tips here. Right. So what I'll, what I'll tell you is that when I'm really clear on why 
we're engaged in whatever we're engaged in. So why we're doing Mm -hmm. a new project or why we're launching a new program or product. And, and I love that idea. There's just nothing that's going to stand in my way. Mm -hmm. And I get excited about it. Having said that, if I understand the, uh, you know, the why behind everything that I do, there are things that I don't love doing that I have to do anyway. I know that's shocking. There are things that I hate doing that I have to do in order to do the work that I love. And the technical term for that is called being an adult. So as long as I understand why I'm doing it, even though I don't, don't want to, I will get it done in you know, quicker time and it, it'll be more productive. If there's something I just really don't get it, I don't understand it and I resist it, then I either need to understand it or I need to let it go. Yeah. Plus. I just, uh, I'm getting better at this and a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with this. I'm getting better at at delegating certain things to other people without feeling like I have to have my hand in in absolutely everything. And that feels really good once, you know, once I got to that point. It's my favorite thing to do is to delegate. If I can delegate something first thing in the morning, I feel like super productive already. So yeah, that's my tip is delegate first thing in the morning and you're all good. (laughs) That's a great idea. Let me write that down. Yeah. If I can find a piece of paper on my desk, which is a pile of piles. Piles and piles. Well, hey, you know, nobody's perfect. (laughs) We're all working on this thing. Amen to that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here, Steve. You were a great guest and really shared a lot of uh, great wisdom. Thanks, Penny. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for being here because, you know, it's because of you because we do love you and we want to provide you with as much value and support in helping you to be more productive, focus your life and your energy on the things that matter to you. And that's what the show is about is to help you to be able to achieve that by sharing tips and tricks from various different people who are doing their thing and doing it in their way. And hopefully you'll be able to take out a few of the tips that are going to be really impactful for you. So thanks for being here. My name is Penny Zanker, and this is Take Back Time. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time. Time.